Many people's estimation of Harry Potter author J.K. Rowling will be clouded and uncertain. Inherent in long-standing goodwill for one of the publishing industry's greatest success stories, whose works are infused with positive values, and which led to a whole generation discovering a love for the exciting immersion of reading, who then entered with uncompromising drive and persistence into the often viciously contended culture wars over trans ideology, running up against a strident opposition, much of it derived from her own fanbase. The long-awaited and highly anticipated open-world video game Hogwarts Legacy has reopened fault lines between the franchise's author and her fans and divided the gaming community. Rowling took no discernible part in the creative process for the game, but will nonetheless earn large sums of money as the owner of the Harry Potter IP. Set in the Wizarding World a hundred years before the events of the Harry Potter stories, the game allows players to create their own characters and do battle with the forces of evil in the familiar surrounds of Hogwarts, Hogsmeade, and the Forbidden Forest. On Twitch, a platform where people watch high-profile gamers play and analyze games online, there have been issues around the release of Hogwarts Legacy, where trans-allied commenters and chat, or on other social platforms, have actively tried to dissuade or even scathingly criticize Twitch streamers for purchasing and playing the game. Search for the game online, and you don't have to look too far to find opposition. Gaming forum Reset Era has banned all mention of the game, a Twitter video encouraging people to boycott has amassed millions of views, and major site GameSpot published an essay about Rowling's supposed anti-transgender stance. A site subsequently shut down was created enabling people to monitor and therefore more efficiently target Twitch streamers who were showcasing the game, a bullying, anti-democratic and illiberal practice. Some trans activists and more general progressive allies have been lamenting their inability to make enough of an impression or decisively impact the narrative, despite the many sensitive additions of the game itself, gender-neutral character options and the inclusion of an NPC transgender character. As it happens, many people just want to play the game and don't feel like they're bad people for doing so, and don't like the notion of their anticipation or enjoyment of the game being associated with some kind of political or ideological standards or identity politics. For many, there will likely be a sense of disruption, a sense of Rowling unfortunately aiming her prodigious intellect and huge profile at a vulnerable target, with a fixity that seems jarringly out of sync with her Wizarding World's themes of empathy, sacrifice, friendship, tolerance, and even diversity. Given the trauma and challenges trans people experience, especially those contending with gender dysphoria at a young age, it would seem on the face of it that Rowling wouldn't naturally elicit much sympathy, and that her reputation within decent, reputable society would be marred by what seems like an almost mean-spirited preoccupation at the same time, a typical person might be aware of a patchy counter-narrative. A group of prominent authors and esteemed public figures, including Booker Prize-winning writer Ian McEwan and famous playwright Tom Stoppard, submitting a signed letter to a newspaper condemning the viciousness of the attacks against Rowling. Or comedian Dave Chappelle aligning himself with Rowling and Netflix facing down the backlash from many of its staff, warning them that if they weren't willing to tolerate a variety of voices, then perhaps Netflix wasn't the organization for them. Along the way, a lot of libertarian, conservative commentators have seemed to hedge on Rowling, supportive of her right to free speech and spirit, but not quite committing to open support, and perhaps a little unsure of the ins and outs of her stance. So, in light of this new controversy, as a cipher for a much larger ongoing one, the question many mainstream, decent people will have been asking for some time is, what should I think of J.K. Rowling? Where is the line between bigotry and a legitimate perspective in the culture war, and is J.K. Rowling on the right side of that line? And what are J.K. Rowling's most offensive tweets and statements? Do they constitute transphobia? And is there a smoking gun? In defending J.K. Rowling, defending doesn't necessarily equate to agreeing with her. It is about defending a legitimate perspective that rises to the level of a civil willingness to agree or agree to disagree on an issue. J.K. Rowling's association with transgender issues began when a woman lost her job after saying that people cannot change their biological sex. Maya Forstater had argued, framing the question of transgender inclusion as an argument that male people should be allowed into women's spaces discounts women's rights to privacy and is fundamentally illiberal. The judge disagreed, stating, the approach is not worthy of respect in a democratic society. Forstater was accused at the Employment Tribunal of having retweeted transphobic material, 
She had previously tweeted that it is unfair and unsafe for trans women to compete in women's sport. She was also accused of gendering a non-binary person. J.K. Rowling tweeted about Maya Forstater. Dress however you please, but force women out of their jobs for stating that sex is real? She referenced the case using the hashtag, I stand with Maya. When it comes to the Forstater flare-up, two things are true at the same time. Rowling was expressing a gradually developed sense of indignation about a social issue, expressing misgivings and even anger at certain developments, shared by many mainstream people. But she had also found a trigger or inflection point for her concerns in the figure of Miss Forstater, a fairly blunt and uncompromising contrarian whose posts and statements were somewhat on the nose. In planting her flag in the mud with Miss Forstater, Rowling had chosen an unsophisticated entry point into a debate requiring sensitivity, strategy, and a slow, measured elaboration for a huge, young, tolerant fanbase that would inevitably be skeptical of their favorite author's contentious perspective. So, out of the gate, Rowling was abrupt and a little clumsy. She persevered, however, and whilst still losing skirmishes in terms of public perception, she found herself gaining a surer footing in terms of the legitimacy of her position. She tweeted, Many health professionals are concerned that young people struggling with their mental health are being shunted towards hormones and surgery when this may not be in their best interests. Many, myself included, believe we are watching a new kind of conversion therapy for young gay people who are being set on a lifelong path of medicalization that may result in the loss of their fertility and or full sexual function. In response, transgender activists and allies pointed out that trans people face a long process when trying to transition, and surgery is currently only available to those over 18. Furthermore, a Stonewall survey found that, of the 3,398 trans patients who spoke to the NHS Gender Identity Service between 2016 and 2017, less than 1% had expressed regrets or detransitioned. However, Rowling cited a documentary by BBC Newsnight, an entirely reputable source, which examined the Gender Identity Development Service, or GIDS, based at London's Tavistock Trust. A hundred pages of transcripts, after a staff review, revealed serious tensions within the service, from the documentary. Staff say they were discouraged from going to the lead safeguarding officer with concerns about children's welfare. They say decisions about medical treatment were taken too quickly. And they say that some parents appear to prefer their child was transgender and straight rather than gay, pushing them towards transition. Rowling then went on. As I've said many times, transition may be the answer for some. For others, it won't. Witness the accounts of detransitioners. Rowling's assertion earned greater respectability when The Atlantic, a bastion of enlightened and respectable society, published a piece entitled Take Detransitioners Seriously, bringing the issue out of the shadows and into a permissible mainstream discourse. Responding to an opinion piece entitled Creating a More Equal Post-COVID-19 World for People Who Menstruate, Rowling tweeted, People who menstruate. I'm sure there used to be a word for those people. Someone help me out. While some people might flinch at the tone of sardonic incredulity, Rowling is absolutely entitled to this response. There are vast swaths of entirely mainstream, ordinary, everyday people who would consider referring to women as people who menstruate as a prissy, academic, linguistic contrivance. On balance, Rowling's arguments were developed and sustained and informed enough to be regarded as a legitimate part of the discourse and for it to be excessive to label her as transphobic. Having examined how all of this played out in public, my conclusion is that Rowling's assertions and the development of her arguments were significantly downplayed and overlooked, often with a distorting emphasis placed on a few phrases, with an editorial emphasis often leaning towards the responses of activists to her claims in a way that was deliberately emotive at best, and reducing her to caricature at worst. It's also important to note that Rowling isn't entirely against the idea of transition for some people, writing, I want to be very clear here. I know transition will be a solution for some gender dysphoric people. Although I'm also aware, through extensive research, that studies have consistently shown that between 60 to 90% of gender dysphoric teens will grow out of their dysphoria. Much of this speaks to a wider issue, and it is here where an important distinction needs to be made. One where the media and culture of commentary has completely failed, and that is between empathy and empowerment on the one hand, and ideology on the other. 
Trans ideology involves to some degree deconstructing established norms or the reality of gender, abstracting gender from sex, and the downplaying of gender as a lived experience for biologically born females. This ideological environment is where Rowling is contesting her most emphatic and nuanced arguments. She tweeted, If sex isn't real, the lived reality of women globally is erased. I know and love trans people, but erasing the concept of sex removes the ability of many to meaningfully discuss their lives. It isn't hate to speak the truth. I respect every trans person's right to live any way that feels authentic and comfortable to them. I'd march with you if you were discriminated against on the basis of being trans. At the same time, my life has been shaped by being female. I do not believe that it's hateful to say so. It's here where the media has failed to properly engage, and failed, most of all, to comprehend and explain how there is, in all of this, a clash between two notions of erasure. On one hand are trans people, not just those seeking recognition entirely as their transitioned agenda, which many mainstream people are okay with, but people who have not transitioned, or have no intention of transitioning who nonetheless want to be afforded the rights and recognitions of women on every level, including the right to enter upon female-only spaces. They consider non-recognition and pushback against such rights as a form of erasure of their identity. On the other hand, many biologically born women, from Rowling's perspective, see this abstracting of sex from gender, the term woman being reduced to people who menstruate, the disregarding of the experience of girlhood and its shaping or defining femininity as a lived experience, and the idea of women who are still anatomically men entering into intimate female spaces, also as a form of erasure, of the safety of women and the very idea of what constitutes being female. The general media's failure to comprehend this idea of a clash between two notions of erasure has been a massive failure. Rowling ties this to notions of misogyny, as she wrote in a later article, I've read all the arguments about femaleness not residing in the sexed body, and the assertions that biological women don't have common experiences, and I find them, too, deeply misogynistic and regressive. The inclusive language that calls female people menstruators and people with vulvas strikes many women as dehumanizing and demeaning. I understand why trans activists consider this language to be appropriate and kind, but for those of us who have had degrading slurs spat at us by violent men, it's not neutral, it's hostile and alienating. So Rowling, sometimes messily, sometimes provocatively, has taken a position, a legitimate one, in a clash between two arguments of erasure. It was this series of tweets, arguing sex is real, which offended transgender identifying people and their supporters, as well as Harry Potter star Daniel Radcliffe. It is possible to sustain these two points of view in your head at the same time, and to acknowledge the legitimacy of both. You might think one is wrong, but that doesn't entitle you to think that the other is impermissible. Rowling has outlined her thinking at length in a personal essay. The avalanche of emails and letters that came showering down upon me, the overwhelming majority of which were positive, grateful, and supportive. They came from a cross-section of kind, empathetic, and intelligent people, some of them working in fields dealing with gender dysphoria and trans people, who are all deeply concerned about the way a socio-political concept is influencing politics, medical practice, and safeguarding. They're worried about the dangers to young people, gay people, and about the erosion of women's and girls' rights. Above all, they're worried about a climate of fear that serves nobody, least of all trans youth, well. Rowling's personal essay received a sadly minimal degree of engagement in the media. This is a shame, because she uses it to clarify and make distinctions that she, a little clumsily, failed to make in the emotion-driven Twitter sphere. There's no doubt Rowling could have disseminated her views in better ways, with more sophistication, in better suited outlets, and by expressing an allegiance with more suitable figures. But, in terms of whether or not her perspectives are legitimate, and whether, as a mainstream individual watching on, it is okay to acknowledge her, without necessarily agreeing with her, yes, you absolutely can. You might be bemused, even bothered, by J.K. Rowling's perspectives, but she is not a pariah. Your kids can read her books, and if you, or they, want to play the new Hogwarts Legacy video game, then do so, and have fun.